I'm Sosteen and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be discussing the making of the Darkling Kefta or Coat. If you don't know who the Darkling is, he's a character from the new Netflix television show Shadow and Bone. If you've been anywhere near my Instagram recently, you'll know that I've been completely obsessed with the costumes from this television show, as well as the characters and the stories. It's an alternate fantasy universe with magic. And they don't really call it magic, they call it the small sciences, and it's wielded by a special group of people called the Grisha. In this universe, they're persecuted as witches, with one country even having actual bounty hunters, and they call themselves witch hunters. The North want our Grisha dead, the South guards its mountains. The leader of this group of people is called General Alexander Kerrigan, who is frequently referred to as the Darkling because of his ability to summon darkness. He's portrayed by the very charismatic and precise actor Ben Barnes. I, I, I say precise because I find his acting like really on point. He has a knack for getting to the psychology of the character and just nailing down that character's motivations and feelings and emotions. And it's true whether he's playing the handsome prison Caspian or a drug addict addicted to robot sex. Or in this case, the single-minded leader of the Grisha, the Darkling. So complete confession, which is probably like really obvious, I'm a sci-fi and fantasy geek through and through. I will openly admit that I became a doctor because of Gillian Anderson's portrayal of Scully and that my son is named after Captain Malcolm Reynolds. But regardless of that, I love the costumes for this show and it's really funny because oftentimes I don't find sci-fi costumes all that intriguing. I honestly find this to be the pinnacle of embroidered world building right up there with the embroidery that we see in Game of Thrones. The incredible thing here though is that everything appears to be completely hand embroidered with beautiful metallic threads or pearls. In fact, from what I've seen, the embroidery appears to be all done by something called gold work, a type of embroidery using metallic threads, beads, and pearl, P-U-R-L. This is a type of sewing where you can work with these like little metal bits that you cut down to the right size and sew each one down. It's a ton of work that I myself don't do personally and cannot be replicated by machine, but is so beautiful and I completely appreciate the skill that actually goes into it. I also want to say that the costume designer, Wendy Partridge, did such a great job making eye-catching, gorgeous costumes without ever succumbing to the desire to be male gazy. Like, male gazy costumes can be fun. Like, I love them sometimes. For instance, I've totally indulged in some of the sexier ones myself. But there is something that I do love about characters that are clearly designed for women by women. Like, look at how beautiful Alina looks in her black kefta that she wears at the Winter Fet. Gorgeous, sexy, and so powerful, all without showing even like an inch of skin. Like, mind blowing how good Wendy Partridge is and was able to pull that off. Ah, oh, like, how much time did people spend on all this embroidery? And the embroidery just is so beautiful and decadent and means so much. Can we just take a moment to admire the awesome Darkling coat or kefta? First off, if you've seen my other video about Shadow and Bone, you may know that I'm a complete Darklina shipper. And, um, yeah. If you want to hear my opinions of the ships, please stick around to the end of the video and you can hear all about that. It's gonna be at the end. If you don't want spoilers, just stop it before that. It's him. General Kerrigan. And the moment I saw Ben Barnes get out of that carriage in that fully embroidered coat and kept and he just like turns around and you're like, oh. I honestly turned to my husband and said, you're getting that. And to his credit, Matt, my husband, literally just said, I know. So... Ivan? My kefta. Let's take a moment to just admire Ben Barnes and all his darkling goodness. The Darkling outfit is an ankle-length kefta or coat with two vents, one on each side and none in the back as far as I can tell, with embroidery along the front, back, collar, and cuffs. The embroidery, I'm pretty sure, is designed to look like Murzos tendrils. Murzos is the magic in this universe. And you can kind of see it when the Darkling, in the Darkling flashlight, you can see it creep up his neck a little bit. So it's dangerous and gorgeous, almost viney sort of look. 
I love the black on black embroidery, which actually if you look close up is like purple and gray, but I did not actually realize that until after I finished my embroidery, so whoops. And personally, I think there's nothing sexier on a man than piles of luscious embroidery. It's either that or a crisp 18th century linen shirt, so you know, it's one or the other. Underneath this, he does wear a leather jerkin type outfit, except with long sleeves with silver clasps. I do plan on making this one too, but I expect it'll be the same pattern as a darkling, except shorter, and I'll probably do that in another episode or just without an episode if it's too easy. Before I get too deep into studying the Darkling Kefta, I would like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, who also kept me company while I did all of the hand sewing portion of this coat, Magellan TV. You'll notice that I do a lot of hand work when it comes to any project, whether it's sewing down the binding, or doing hand rolled hems, or just digitizing. The hand sewing portion is honestly my favorite part of any project, and I personally keep a cart full of things that need hand sewing at all times. It's actually really relaxing for me to do that after a long day of work. Just pick something up from that basket and just make it pretty and show so even just the tiniest bit of progress on it. And I love having something good to watch while I do it. Currently, I'm really into documentaries. It's awesome getting interesting facts about history, science, or the world in a format that you can listen to mostly and then look up whenever you want to see a pretty picture. So it's a nice combination. And Magellan Television has so many different documentaries to choose from with over 3,000 in their collection. All from varied topics like the history of Russia, sharks, art history, and science. Currently, I'm watching Rome, Empire Without Limit, hosted by Mary Beard, who just is, who is just such a sassy Roman historian. One thing I really love about her documentaries is that she really takes a focus on the individuals of the empire and what it must have been like to be just like a normal person in that time period, the way that Romans thought nearly 2,000 years ago. And the crazy thing about it is that they're not so different from people today and it's just such a fascinating documentary. But if history isn't your thing, they have a ton more. They also have documentaries on art, medicine, musicians, ancient worlds, and by some other incredible documentary makers such as Valdemar Januszczyk, who you may know is just like phenomenal. Magellan is a new type of streaming service run directly by the filmmakers. If you'd like to try it, go to my description and click on the link to get a full month free trial. Thank you so much Magellan for sponsoring my video and for keeping me company while I sew. Now, after having been tragically forced to watch all of the Darkling scenes over and over again to study this coat, as well as spend a ton of time on social media to scour the different Darkling images from the producer, the actor, and the show, I believe this kefta is made very similar to all the other keftas, such as the one that I patterned in my last video. There are princess seams in the front and the back, and the skirt piece is a separate piece from the top with a dart sewn in. However, the big difference between the way that I believe that the original coat was constructed versus the way that I plan on constructing mine is that I plan on embroidering the fabric itself directly. I personally don't believe that they embroidered the fabric directly, but rather it was done by an applique method. So basically what you do is you embroider, do all the embroidery separately, most likely on a very thin silk or cotton, and then those pieces are then carefully cut out and sewn onto the coat as appliques. This method is very commonly done in TV shows and movies because it allows multiple people to work on the embroidery for one item at the same time and then combine it at the end rather than have one person sit and embroider just one piece, which can take forever and it will be much slower. So I think this makes sense for a production like Shadow and Bone, where you have so many different embroidered things. If you look at social media pictures of different keftas up close, you can see a thin outline around the embroidery, which is where they likely cut the silk or cotton netting out. For me personally, I prefer to embroider directly onto the fabric, which comes with its pros and cons. This does mean that if I mess up on even one section of the, of the piece, that means the entire piece has to be restarted from scratch. And considering that this one coat has 18 to 20 motifs on each one and there's four of these pieces, each one takes about like somewhere between 12 to 15 hours to embroider, it's quite a time commitment if I even make a single mistake. On the other hand, making applique limits the kind of stitches you can do on a machine and it requires quite a bit of time spent cutting out the different embroidered pieces and then sewing or gluing it on. So, um, but yeah, that's just so time consuming. I would prefer to just take a risk and embroider directly on the fabric. So the reason I went on this long tangent about 
applique versus sewing is because I think this plays directly in how to how the coat was made. If you have an applique, you can have it cross multiple seam lines, which you can definitely see the Darklings embroidery doing. And it's much more likely that they just did appliques. So that explains how they were able to have the Darklings embroidery go across multiple seams at the waist, at the top, at the bottom, and even across darts. But that would make it really difficult for me to do with my embroidery machine when I'm sewing directly. So instead of having a waist seam, I decided to just nix the waist seam and just extend the princess seams all the way down so that I have one solid piece of wool to embroider on. It's a huge design change, but I felt like this was necessary for my own personal sanity. And honestly, it's black on black. I don't think anyone's gonna notice unless they really, really want to. To start, I need to pattern the kefta. Since drafting for a six foot three man is notoriously difficult, especially without a dress form, I decided to start with another pattern as a starting point. I chose the Vogue 9290 men's bomber style jacket pattern. I like the placement of the princess seams in the front and the back, as well as the center closure. So I got this and made it a short jacket so I could um, put it on top of mat and just fit it. Once I liked the fitting for the top, I then made a second muslin, this time extending the length of the jacket bottom, flaring it slightly for better movement and made a second muslin. Once I knew I liked it, I then scanned in the front and back center pieces onto my computer so that I would know how to place the designs. Meanwhile, I was digitizing the Darkwing embroidery for the past month or so. Luckily, there were a lot of promotional images of the different characters wearing their jackets up close. The Darkwing one actually gave a really phenomenal view of the coat embroidery, so I simply used this with the contrast turned way up to digitize. And I was really enraptured by the different intertwining branches, so I really tried to keep the layered look of the different like strands of Mirzos, like layered on top of each other. I stitched it out onto some cotton fabric after I digitized it, just some scraps, just to see how it looked using metallic threads. Now the original coat on the TV show looks like it was done with the metal pearl embroidery, which I mentioned. It has a very distinct like liney quality to it. And I want to try to capture that look. So what I did was I did a base of very dark black metallic threads done very dense. I had 150 stitches per inch. And then I overlaid that with a very loose stitch around 50 stitches per inch to give it that lined quality. So even if I wasn't doing mine with the hand pearl, it would still have some look of interest to it. Once that was decided, I ended up making around three different versions of the Merzost branches. There appears to be at least two repeats of the larger Merzost design, one on each side of the chest, and then a smaller one below it, and a trail of very small ones that just go straight down. I did some stitch outs to make sure I loved all of it, and then placed these three different Merzost designs into the scanned in pattern of Matt's coat pieces for the front and back. While I was digitizing this, I had just gone ahead and bought about eight yards of some beautiful wool broadcloth from WM Booth Draper. I then traced out the front and back pattern pieces onto the wool using chalk and then stitched out the coat pieces.
I cut out all the pieces and started assembling the coat. I sewed together the front of the coat to the side fronts and the back to each other and the side backs, being sure to iron open all the seams. One tip I'd love to share about embroidery. If you like embroidery to be an exact mirror when you sew it up, such as the embroidery on the back, I highly recommend pinning the two pieces together, matching up the points on the embroidery that you'd like to be exactly mirrored using a pin every one to two inches. Only once after the pieces are actually completely pinned together do I actually cut out the panel. And before, afterwards, before I remove the pins, I sew the two pieces together, and I find this to give me the best possible mirror image. Afterwards, I sewed the front to the back. For the collar, I made one, but I realized it was just a little bit too small, so I ended up making it again. To do this, I stitched out the collar, cut it out without any seam allowances, since the seams will be finished with silk taffeta, and then interface it with iron-on horsehair interfacing. Then, I stitched a piece of wool to the back to cover up the horsehair side. You'll notice that all the edges are left raw again for now, and we'll finish those later. Now the nice thing about wool broadcloth is that the edges don't really fray, so I really didn't have to finish this or line it. However, I do know that my husband has a tendency to sweat a lot, so I did want to line it with linen, even though it wasn't necessary. So I got some lovely black linen, washed and tumble dried it, ironed it, and cut out the pieces. I did leave the back short so that it stops at the waist, but for the front pieces I made them floor length so that I could cover up the horsehair interfacing that I ironed to the front of the coat, just to kind of give it some more stability. I sewed the whole thing up and then I tucked this into the wool exterior, wrong sides together, right sides out, and I lined up all the seams and all the edges and pinned them together. I then used a 3 8 inch seam allowance to baste all of the edges together on all the pieces. Meanwhile, while I was embroidering, I had made some black silk taffeta like tape. I wouldn't call this bias tape, it's just binding. Since it's two and a half inch wide silk, cut selvage to selvage, it's not really bias tape. I sewed about six of these together, seam, um, selvage to selvage, and ironed open the seams, as well as a half inch seam allowance along one long side. Now looking at the original Darkling coat, there's an edge of what appears to be silk binding along every edge. After experimenting with a ruler and my husband's head, I chose to make mine about three quarters of an inch to finish mine. I got the silk binding I had made and pinned it right sides together all along the edge that was already, that was unfinished. I then sewed all of these together all the way around on my baby lock soprano. Here's a nifty tip for mitered corners with a machine. What you do is sew until you're about half an inch away from the corner. Then you cut, then you cut, like go back and forth on the stitch, end it, and then cut it. And you get your silk tape, hold it at a 90 degree angle away from the fabric and fold it again, this time towards the fabric. Then you can continue your machine sewing about half an inch away from the edge again. Afterwards, you'll have to tack down the corners by hand, but it'll give you a really crisp mitered corner, even with the machine. So I did this all the way around, which took some time. Afterwards, I ironed the seam open and then folded the silk tape binding around the raw edge and pinned it to the opposite side. I sewed this part down by hand while going through a fantastic documentary about suffragettes from the turn of the century.
I did this also for the sleeve edges. Believe it or not, after this, I was done. There was no closures on this as far as I can tell, which was amazing. I hate doing closures. Now, I do want to add that this, this is not the whole outfit, obviously. I also want to make the undercoat or the jerkin or whatever that is that he wears underneath. I've already gone ahead and ordered some class from Amazonian Cosplay because she makes some beautiful stuff. But I'll hold off on making this for another day. But even without that, I still wanted Matt to just try on the coat. And if we're gonna have him try on the code, I might as well edit him into some scenes. Fine, make me your villain. Fine, make me your villain. Fine, make me your villain. What good talkies, I never slice you. You're too cute to be sliced. In any case, thank you so much for joining me in today's journey. I'll link all my fabric and pattern sources below. As usual, the files will go up for sale today along with a limited number of appliques for anyone who's interested in making their own Darkling kefta. I honestly can't wait to make more keftas, including the matching cloaks and eventually Alina's formal like winter fat kefta, which I'm slowly working towards. If you like this video, please remember to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Kitty and kiss. So my opinion about the ships. In the book, I hated both Mal and Darkling. I actually kind of hated Mal more. Yeah, the Darkling gave off abusive boyfriend vibes, but I'm kind of good at getting out of relationships that are toxic, so that really didn't bother me. Also, um, it's a, he's a, like the Darkling was so one-dimensionally that evil that I didn't real I found him less like threatening. But Mal Alf acted all sweet, but was constantly jealous and passive aggressive. And he even tells Alina in the book at one point that she wishes she was ordinary and didn't have this power. And that kind of insidious mind game where you pretend to be a nice guy, but you're not really, is so horrific. And so I was completely team single. I wanted Alina to not end up with any of them. No one deserved her. So in the show, I have the opposite problem. I love them both so much. Both of them have fantastic motivations and you can tell that both the Darkling and Mal really genuinely love Alina in different ways. And Mal, Mal is no longer a jealous idiot, but rather just a sweet guy who just really loves the girl that he grew up with. And their relationship makes sense. And meanwhile, the Darkling has just been so sad and in darkness this whole time. And Alina literally brings some light into his life and he just wants to spend his, like his eternity with her. And it's, ah, I just love that ship. So. I'm actually Team Thrupple. I think that she should spend her mortal life with Mal and then her mortal life with the Darkling because, you know, the Darkling himself says, I'm patient, I can wait. So like, yeah, let him wait. Granted, my husband does make up the excellent point that like Alina's gonna come home from work one day and like Mal's gonna be sliced in half and it's gonna be like, oh, whoops, a random slice of darkness just came out of nowhere and sliced him in half. And maybe the darkness is not that patient and Mal, Mal Matt's probably right that that would actually happen, but 
that is my ship. So anyways, thanks for listening.